So welcome to this second morning of teachings and uh, welcome back everybody. I know that you already had a silent meditation, some of you, quite a good turnout, I think. Um, and Venerable Lepeka was chanting the Metta Sutta, so hopefully you've got the words of loving kindness in your hearts. And now for the practice. So um, good morning, Ajahn Brahm. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> In Australia, yes. <laughs> and uh, really wonderful to be with you again. And uh, this morning we're going to do some go. Uh, what is it? First, the talk, I think. Uh, get correct. Yeah. And to get your hindrances really small. And then there'll be a guided meditation. So we'll do the morning in two parts with a little break in the middle. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Ajahn Brown. Thank you, Ayachanda. Thank you, everybody, for coming again today. And uh, I did uh, check in with Ayachanda earlier, what she was talking about yesterday, to make sure there's a continuity here. And she was talking something about the uh, five hindrances and uh, how they are uh, diminished, lessened, and the uh, opposite, you know, which is that clarity of mind is uh, enhanced. And what I said yesterday about the, uh, the purpose of the, say, the breath meditation, the very beginning is to make sure you make the establishing of mindfulness a priority. And mindfulness has so many different levels to it. Now, first of all, there's that small level where you can just, you can see, you can hear, but what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Are you seeing, hearing, or knowing accurately? Or are we uh, just ignoring, or just in denial of the things we don't like, or just always wanting something more? And it's one of the things which I've kind of seen over the last few years in the West. Now, the jhanas are becoming a little bit more well-known and a little bit more important. And so many people are, unfortunately, they are uh, bending their perceptions to try and make it like this is a jhana. And when they're doing that, the hindrance is still very powerful. And what their experience is not a jhana. I remember years ago at a retreat, I mean, this was about almost 30 years ago, 35 years ago, at a retreat, it's only a weekend retreat, and one of the gentlemen there, I asked him how he was going. And he said, oh, I'm having a terrible retreat this time. I can only get the first down or I can't get the second. And when he said things like that, I realized, you know, this fellow has been badly taught. Because even getting a first jhana, you're blissed out. You're happy. You can't be upset about everything. Because after the jhanas, these five hindrances are really, really, really absent for a long time. And so you're like walking on air. You're really happy. And as I said, I think you can hardly go to sleep afterwards, you know, at least for a few hours. And you don't want to go to sleep. You know, the, the mind is bright and clear. But anyhow, it's nice to know exactly what that meditation, what that mindfulness really is. It is being aware. But I always say it's being aware in this present moment uh, without all this thinking, labeling stuff. I think that is one of the uh, obstacles which... Um, stop you seeing clearly. Whenever you are looking at, are you looking at it clearly? Or are you looking at it, trying to find out something or expecting something or interpreting something according to either your culture or your beliefs or expectations? And it's usually the case when the mindfulness is bound up with labels and uh, perceptions that are based on culture rather than just belief, rather than, sorry, not, not even with belief, but bound up with a lack of clarity, a lack of simplicity, uh, and a lack of this uh, courage to see things in you in a different way. When it's bound up by that, you only see what you're looking for. You're not seeing what's really there. And that's one of the reasons why I have my own definition of mindfulness, but I'm not sure if it will be accepted by the mindfulness community, the ones which is the um, making money capital, uh, making money mindfulness uh, community. But my definition of that mindfulness, of real mindfulness, is that, you know, you are, you are aware of either any of these senses, and you are not uh, describing it, 
you're not expecting anything, you're in this present moment, and there's kindness there as well. The kindness keeps you there, and it's a natural phenomenon, the kindness. And when you are not wanting anything, you're not bound by anything from the past, and your sense of freedom, and it's a clarity there which gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And it, are you just doing, uh, making these uh, definitions, not from theory, but just from experience. There are times when you are so aware that even small things you can be aware of. Uh, a good example of that. There's a common experience uh, in meditation. You're getting still, you still got awareness of say your body, but I should be coming aware, more and more aware of the body. Sometimes you feel like there's ants crawling over your body. It's very, very sensitive on your skin. And even to the point that sometimes you feel like you're rising up into the air or falling into the ground or expanding and doing weird, weird things. Now that uh, experience is just where your mindfulness is getting very strong and it's kind of being liberated by what you think is possible, what is not possible. In these states, you are not rising up into the air, you're not expanding. It's just the way that the mindfulness can see and is allowed to kind of play with perceptions and to see perceptions which are impossible. This is where your mindfulness has got some sense of freedom. When that mindfulness becomes free like that, I always tell people, just enjoy it. It's weird, it's fun, and there's no harm to it. And after a while, if you don't try and suppress that feeling of growing mindfulness, it actually becomes much more realistic, more deep, and more enjoyable. Many times I've told people that where you are meditating right now, you now look at your surroundings and see, and I'm just looking at the bricks on the wall, which have been painted yellow. And I just look at those uh, bricks and if I can see them and they're just bricks, my mindfulness is not strong. But if I can see those bricks and they start to become beautifully yellow, and I can see all of the texture in those bricks in front of me, and also all the marks where I've stuck something with blue tack on the brick to remind me of something. When I see those, after a while you can start to see it much more, and it usually is the nature of strong mindfulness that what you see becomes actually very beautiful. And of course, that's a wonderful experience to have in meditation. You're not in jhanas yet, but when you come out of the meditation even, whatever you see, whatever you hear, you know, whatever you even uh, taste as food becomes more delicious than you've ever tasted before. And I love telling that story of, uh, you know, on a monastic retreat where you know, every range retreat, I have a couple of weeks by myself in my cave, and I remember coming out of that retreat and going to a breakfast and they gave me baked beans. <laughs> you know, I like baked beans. But when I, I just put one baked bean, a single baked bean into my mouth you know, at the end of this retreat in the morning breakfast. And when I put one baked bean into my mouth and I let it stay there and let it kind of melt into the mouth and it was so delicious. The tastiest baked bean I've ever had in my life. And it was just that I asked who was a cook and it was a fellow called Mr. Hines. That was the name on the can, <laughs> Hines Bay Beans. And just one little um, bean, you know, the tomato sauce on the outside was like tangy enough. Uh, it wasn't salty, but it was a taste sensation. And I really enjoyed that for a couple of minutes. And then when I allowed the teeth to crush that sort of baked bean, it just melted into my mouth. And sometimes I can't really imagine, you know, anything more delicious than eating even just one baked bean after a, a meditation retreat. And it was typical of what happens after you've had some nice meditations and what you even taste is absolutely gorgeous. And you're not doing this in order to eat baked beans and enjoy them more. It's not like a, a, a sales pitch for Mr. Hines. All it really is, is that it shows whatever you're eating, whatever you're seeing, whatever you're experiencing, when the, the hindrances are weakened, you know, all of your senses 
becomes so powerful and so deep, you see more deeply into uh, the five sense world. But of course, that's just what's starting. After a while, those five senses will vanish. And that's the job of this meditation. Once the five senses have vanished, what's left is the sixth sense, the mind. And that's where we can really understand you know, what this mind is and how it works. And that gives us the great insights of meditation. But first of all, those five hindrances, it's something I remember from so long ago. I forget which philosopher said this. It was not the Buddha, or the Buddha said it in other ways, that when you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. It's that wanting uh, stirs up the mind. I think I wanted to say this simile yesterday, but I didn't have time. It was Ajahn Chah's simile of uh, the leaves on the, in the forest or leaves on a bush in the garden. He used to use whatever he had around him uh, for uh, his visual effects. And he said, look at those leaves on the bushes or trees around us. They're moving. Why? They're moving because of the wind is blowing them. But if that wind vanished or disappeared or stopped, then the leaves would still be moving. The momentum hasn't been exhausted yet. But there will come a time when the leaves stop moving uh, because the wind has uh, vanished for a while. It's a still afternoon. And then you will find that the, the leaves eventually become perfectly still all by themselves because that's their natural default state. And that really kept, stayed with me. It's a beautiful uh, description of you know, how that first hindrance of wanting disturbs the mind. But when it stops and there's no more wanting, then you will find that the mind is still not still, still not still. It remains moving, but it gets less and less and less and less. And as it gets less and less and less, you find eventually the mind becomes perfectly still all by itself. And you don't do it. You don't have to hold it still. You don't have to make it still. It's what happens when you let go of the cause of movement, which is the wanting. And then after a while, you discover that the mind is so still, you don't have to do anything, and it builds up its own energy, which means if you are, have got your eyes open, things become really clear. If you are listening to something, you can listen with so much depth because the senses have actually been clarified, been cleaned, made, made more powerful. And that's just a sign that your mindfulness has really increased big time. So this is what Ajahn Chah was saying. And this is how we can meditate, learning how to let go of wanting anything. Even small expectations you find will disturb the mind because the small expectations are more refined part of mindfulness, of the hindrances, sorry. And when you can experience, you know, just with the five senses active, the feelings in the body, or the feelings, or the, the sight, or the sound, or the tastes, they get enhanced, they get empowered. And that's a sign that you're getting more and more mindful, more and more aware of this world around you. This meditation doesn't sort of limit uh, your experiences, but you do eventually find that even the most beautiful baked bean or the most uh, beautiful sights is something there which is still missing. You might be very still, but the taste eventually disappears. So after a while, we learn how to know when this mindfulness is growing, when it's strong. That's one of the first things I'd like to emphasize. You can notice be aware yourself of what strong mindfulness is and what weak mindfulness is. And what causes that strong mindfulness? A lot of time it's sitting still and noticing you don't need to work these hindrances and make them active. We'd always feel that, you know, if you want to get something, you have to want it first of all and strive for it. It's one of those teachings which, you know, you know I always object to. Striving is not the way. If I look at the Eightfold Path, you know, it was the striving 
which the Buddha did for so many years, it creates tiredness, exhaustion, even sickness. And instead of striving, we have this welcoming, this being at ease with, you know, allowing things to be, opening the door of your heart unconditionally to whatever you're experiencing. And when you practice that, then the hindrances decline. And then the, uh, the mind becomes much more clear. And when it becomes clear, then it's easy to whatever you wish to focus on in your meditation, it's much easier to have this fuller awareness of it. The awareness becomes more deep. And it always happens that as you are focusing on something without any effort, of course, the energies of your mind become stronger. And it means that you're experiencing what we call like happiness. It was hard to find similes for where this happiness comes from. But I always remember uh, that sometimes they have these advertisements for your early morning cup of coffee. And they said, don't even talk to your boss or sometimes maybe to your partner until they've had their first cup of coffee. Otherwise, they'll be really grumpy. And, but once you've had a good cup of coffee as a, you know, in the lay world, then you've got energy and it's easy for you to, to talk to somebody who's been energized just by caffeine. But that was like a kind of simile. When you've been energized, you know, with your mindfulness, everything is more acceptable, it seems, more beautiful, more delightful. And that is actually showing you what this mindfulness actually does. Not only does it make all the sensations, even your five senses, more alive, more clear, but it also gives this extra piti sukha, you know, which is an important part of our meditation practice. When you energize your meditation, of course, it's so much easier to sit for long periods of time. You're not doing it. I think I mentioned yesterday, the mind leaps onto the meditation objects because it's fun, enjoy it, it's delightful. And it's also really rewarding in the sense that, you know, you feel, wow, this is the meditation. How on earth can people spend their holidays by going to a monastery for meditation retreat? And so many, many times people feel that it's an act of endurance to go into a monastery on a retreat. But or to go to a retreat center. But of course, you know, you've heard me many times try and counter that perception by saying that any meditation center is a club med. You know, okay, club meditation, not club Mediterranean. But the club Mediterranean, people want to go there on holiday and they get tired out with all the activities. But to go into club med out on Boar's Hill, if, whenever that happens, <laughs> the meditation retreat there, or club med Zoom, then you can understand it gives you so much peace and so much happiness. It does not tire you out, but invigorates you, not so much bodily, but I bodily as well, but invigorates the mind, makes the mind happy and light, and it's easy to deal with things. Many of the hindrances are being uh, lessened, and the main way of listing those hindrances, and it is by renunciation, letting go of excess things you don't need to do, letting go of the excess thoughts which aren't really useful in this meditation. And one of the ways to do that is you know, trying to perceive more absence of things rather than attainments of things. In other words, whenever you, you know, you're in your house, don't look at all the things which are there. Look for the things which are not there. The space between the walls, the space between the people, the space between uh, the, you know, the, the ceiling and the floor. And a, a hall or a house is so much space inside. Yes, we put things in it, and those are the only things we really notice. Over in our um, monastery, we really try hard, often unsuccessfully, to keep the shrine free from flowers and, please excuse us, incense and other little knickknacks. And then 
trouble is that when people go in, they say there's nothing on there. So they go and buy something and put it on there. Then we take it off and put it away somewhere. So this is actually how we try and keep that emptiness, even in a meditation hall, as the main thing which is on the shrine, because we worship that emptiness. We see its worth. That's what worship means. And so once we celebrate emptiness and the space in the hall rather than the things in the hall, then we tend to see more space even in our mind. We have less thoughts, less knickknacks in our brain. We're not really valuing all those thoughts and knickknacks. Instead, we're valuing the space and the silence. And once you have that silence in the mind, it's, it is gorgeous. It is one of the most beautiful sounds you could ever uh, feel, experience. Of course, it gives you great joy. You know, I know uh, a monastic who used to love you know, listening to Led Zeppelin, but silence is much more delightful. And if everyone can have those moments of silence, where you, you, that's what you're hearing. It's the emptiness in, a, in the sound space. You're closing your eyes. And so you see the emptiness, the great space in that part of your brain, which was occupied by sight and taste and smell disappear. And all you have is your body. And when that disappears, wow, that's so much freedom. I know that many people who have had out of the body experiences, that when they come out of those experiences and, and they come back, they always say just how beautiful it was when they were floating outside of their body. In other words, that the heaviness of the body was discerned. Even if they were young and healthy, it's still a heavy burden. And of course, for some of us, it's heavier than others. <laughs> Okay, that's a little joke, but I can't be serious all the time. And so when we realize how heavy this physical body is in the sense of, uh, uh, of physical touch, then we can let it go much more easily. And when we let it go much more easily, we can also let go of much of the thinking, which is about you know, the, the world of the five senses, which we think mostly about the world of the five senses or fantasies and dreams conjectures about the world of the five senses because that's the only experiences we really have to define ourselves and when we sort of renounce those and then there's only silence left there's only sort of the sight disappeared there's only the the body vanished there's no smells there's no taste and that absence of things that becomes a, a realm of delight the absence of thoughts becomes delightful. It's like the silence in the mind. And just like looking at the spaces in a room, if we can see the spaces between our thoughts, to see the silence is more in our mind during a meditation retreat than any thoughts. And then we start to question all these names we give things and people. Now, why do we give them these names? They're just approximations. That's the best we can have. But it's not the truth. The truth can only be seen, heard, felt, and known when the mind is still. And for those of you who like beauty, who likes the depth of uh, music, silence is by far the most powerful. And when you actually, once you actually notice that and allow it to grow in you, you find it becomes much easier to meditate. All these thoughts are just like distractions and you don't encourage them. I know that many people used to say that the thoughts just come into my mind, uninvited, I never invited them. I used to assume that, but then when your mindfulness increases, you find there are no such things as stray thoughts. They don't come into your mind uninvited. You actually get kind of bored and you invite them in. Sometimes you're looking for them, any old thought to bring in to distract yourself because we're not used to silence. But once that silence is very strong, it's obviously more beautiful 
And it's obviously the mind loves to stay there. It's like a default state of the mind. That's what the Buddha said. It's not you make those leaves on a tree. That's what Ajahn Chah said. You don't make the leaves on a tree still. You notice their stillness is what happens when they're not doing anything else. It's the stillness of your mind is natural. It's what your mind does when it's not forced to do something else. And after a while, it becomes a natural state, a very beautiful state, a state of rest and energy. And it's a state where you can notice these five hindrances getting less, 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 less. Until those hindrances are kind of gone for a short while. And when those hindrances are gone, you can trust, you can know that what you're seeing is clear and true. Of course, I remember so many times that a good example, which just comes to my mind when I talk about the absence of hindrances, with the five hindrances, you now one of those hindrances, which is sometimes the most difficult to understand, is the hindrance of doubt. And, you know, that doubt, because it's the fifth hindrance, sometimes the teachers never get around to explaining it properly. But when you are uh, peaceful in your meditation, the doubt gets less, 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 less. And just the simile I use, which is not really making any claims for myself, but that time when I asked myself after a nice meditation, what's my earliest memory? And the earliest memory, I can't talk about past lives, but it was early in this life when I was back in the pram being pushed around by my mum. And it was a weird experience because I could feel the texture of those, uh, uh, what you call it, cloth covering me. I could f uh, see my mother, but one of the things I knew that I never recognized my mother because of how she looked. I recognized her smell because I never knew at the time uh, that a little infant, that is the most important sense is a sense of smell. That's how I recognized that this was my pram, familiar territory. That was my mother, that was my father by how he smelt. It was a weird experience, but I, the reason I bring that up was because throughout that whole time, I was very clear. And when I came out of that state of meditation, I just didn't have any doubt at all that was real, that was, you know, me experiencing that so many years earlier. And I couldn't sort of figure that out, first of all, why I was so confident that that was a real experience. And of course, the reason was that the doubts had been suppressed at that time. It wasn't there. And so that doubt was something which was fascinating for me. To actually to see it once it had vanished and really understand it. So this was actually how we can... Uh, understand what these hindrances are and how beautiful it is and still it is and how more powerful our mind is once those hindrances are gone or at least they're um, lessened we find out exactly what they are their importance and how we can go past them go through them and where they're not there anymore and imagine that imagine you're just sitting perfectly content so there's nothing you want in the whole world you have no ill will, you're content, you're satisfied. There's nothing you're trying to get rid of. There's nothing you're trying to strive towards. Imagine what that feels like. It's like a sense of peace. You don't have to change things in order to find that peace. You said you let them be. They're more than good enough. And then there's no sort of sloth and torpor. You're energized. There's no restlessness. You're poised. And the fact of doubt is gone. Your mind is clear. But once you have those mind that uh, five hindrances suppress that much, uh, abandon, release that much, you have you know, pretty much freedom from them. Then, of course, you can actually watch uh, just a brick in front of you, which is what I'm doing now. Or you can just watch your breathing. You can watch the body sensations. You can watch anything and it's clear. And because it's clear, it's also delightful. And because it's delightful, it's a delight which keeps you there. 
The delight, the happiness is the glue which sticks your attention onto the object. And you're just happily sitting there for quite a long time. And when that sort of happens, you find out that this is a stillness. Call Samadhi. Please never understand Samadhi to mean concentration. Samadhi is stillness. It always meant that. And the stillness is you can realize just how kind of holy that is and how revered the stillness is. The stillness is like a sister of silence. When there is silence, the whole world becomes still, including the ones inside of you. When the silence leads to that quietness inside the mind, of course it becomes very still. And the stillness allows energy to build up. And when those five hindrances are being suppressed, the mind energizes, and afterwards those five hindrances stay suppressed. In other words, they disappear for quite a long time. And you can't fake that. Now, if you try and fake it, you're just controlling it. It's not a natural stillness, and it soon fades away. And it doesn't have these other qualities to it, like the ease and happiness and joy. That's one of the reasons why in the Narakapana Sutta, the Buddha actually pointed out that it's usually not just the five hindrances which disappear. Together with those five hindrances, there's this quality called arity, which is discontent, not liking something, and also weariness. I don't know why it is that sometimes people meditate and they feel tired afterwards. That must mean because they're trying to do something, the five hindrances haven't really been dealt with properly. And after a while, you just get this great tiredness and weariness. And a lot of times people just give up meditation because they're too tired and too weary to meditate. But if it's a real getting rid of the five hindrances, then you find that the, the tiredness and weariness vanish. And that means the five hindrances go. And they get more and more that you experience the five hindrances vanishing, the more and more you get less invested in them. In other words, they're not sort of things which you want to encourage. Now, wanting, now how much do you need? I mean, honestly, okay, I'm a monk. I've lived simply for the last almost 50 years now. And it's gorgeous being able to live simply. It has so, so, so many benefits. Even just recently, you know, traveling over to, to Thailand and before over to Melbourne and before over to Indonesia, you know, just in the last six weeks or so, I just carry one tiny shoulder bag and no need to have suitcases. Just even that simplicity gives me so much freedom. And now, just one of my last memories of a couple of days ago, just going through Perth Airport and you know, through the customs check. And many of those people working there kind of know our monks now, simply because we always travel with such few belongings. And so they just wave us through. Don't need to check our bags. There's nothing in there anyway. And so... And it's light to carry. You don't have to worry about losing things. And you know how to live simply. And living simply helps the happiness of a monastic or a meditator. And it also increases the awareness. So even though you come back late at night, you're still really aware and clear-minded of what's going on. And these are some of the examples of what happens when the mindfulness is lessened, it gives you a much happier life, and you can see and feel more emptiness around you, more space in your life. Life is not crowded with things to do. And I say that as a monk, it has lots of responsibility. When you have that emptiness, uh, you see it more, the hindrances become less, the space between things becomes greater, and you can enjoy much more of what I, th I think I said to you yesterday, the in-between moments of life. And that's what mostly where you live, in-between things. 
you finish one meditation, you're just going off to the toilet, you haven't arrived at the toilet yet, you're in between. Those in between moments of life. That's where you can really enjoy the solitude, the peace. Even if you're in an airport and thousands of people are around you, you can still enjoy the space between things. You haven't arrived, you haven't left, you're in between. It's a beautiful place to be. You're not trying to get anywhere. You're not lingering where you've come from. You're just in between. And that's where the most space in life is. That's where the hindrances just can't really survive that long. And in that in-between moments of even your meditation, you know, where the hindrances get less, mindfulness gets more, and you can experience what it's like to really be aware. That by itself is a lot of happiness. And when you sit down, cross your legs and be silent, that will take you into some great meditations. You don't want the meditations. You don't not want the meditations. You're not dull. You're not bored. You're not restless. And there's no doubt of what you're doing and why you're doing it. So that's a little talk, first of all, about the hindrances and about what happens when they get overcome. And it's much better than reading about it is doing it because when you're doing it, Yes, you can feel the quietness and the stillness and the beauty of where you are. Okay, so that's a little talk. And for 40 minutes, I'm behaving myself today and <laughs> trying to do what's convenient for you all. So now we can have like a little toilet break or just getting up and stretching your legs break or having a glass of water break. And then in the five minutes time, We'll start the guided meditation. Is that okay? Sad, sad, sad. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I have kind of quarter past. So there's most people back now, what you can see. Good. So for the guided meditation uh, this morning for you, I was uh, going to do a Buddha Anusati, which is the, the mindfulness of the Buddha. But it's not as many of you may expect. Years ago, I was asked to teach a group of children at a school, and I never realized this was a kindergarten school. And so I got the kids to imagine they were the Buddha. And I'm going to ask you to do this now. If you don't wish to try this type of meditation, you can always actually turn off the audio and just sit there quietly. But this was very effective and it used something which we tend not to do enough of in Theravada Buddhism. Use some of our powers of imagination. Many of you may have a Buddha statue in front of you or close by. And you look at that Buddha statue, and it may be in the meditation posture. So you imagine what it must be like to be freshly enlightened. With your eyes closed, imagine it. You are like the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, freshly enlightened. What must that feel like? That all the fears of the future are no longer there. You're not hiding them or suppressing them. They don't exist for you anymore. And any feelings or traumas or bad experiences of the past, they too have been separated from you until you cannot reach that past anymore. You're free from the past and the future. They can no longer grab you 
and irritate you or poke you. You're just here, right now, free, free from everything that happened to you in the past, free from any fear of what happens to you in the future. You're fully enlightened, at peace. What's done has been done. There is no more lists for you anymore, things you must do and complete. There's nothing to strive towards anymore. Everything that ever was wanted is now gone. You're free from desire. And no desire can ever arise in you anymore. You're at peace, content with this very moment. Even if there was a sickness inside of you or a pain, your body is so strong because of the enlightenment. It just vanishes. I hope you've experienced some of these meditation states where you just look at an ache or a pain and it can't stay with you. And imagine what it's like to be fully enlightened. You can zap that feeling in your knee or in your shoulder and it just vanishes. It's just the nature of the power that your mind can possess. Possess is not really the right word, but of the nature of your mind. It's at peace with things. It has no stress or craving anymore. Your body is perfectly at ease. It's like everything is loose and nothing is stretched. So everything can heal. Nothing is squashed or inflamed. So everything is totally loose and comfortable. And you're not trying to have a sit in any posture which is trying to impress anybody. Your body chooses the posture because your body knows how it feels and what's comfortable and sustainable for it. And it chooses that posture automatically. You don't get involved with theories. You're at peace. There's nothing more to attain. So you're not striving and struggling anymore. You're sitting down just perfectly at ease, not wanting anything in the whole world because there's nothing to want anymore. And you look at the wanting not as a way of getting peace and happiness, but a way of obstructing the peace and the happiness and the depth of the meditation. Wanting is seen for what it really is, just a burden to meditation, not a help to it. So you imagine you're sitting down just under a tree you have hardly any possessions to worry about. Nothing to fix, nothing to mend, nothing to improve. In fact, you realize that there's nothing to improve at all in your life. You're fully free, enlightened, free from all the burdens. Not just free from an after, for an afternoon, but free forever. There's no more burdens left to you. You can, as an enlightened being, you can sleep anywhere if your body needs to rest. You can actually go anywhere. And you'll always find food because there's so many kind people in this world. And this is where you can feel free from all concerns. The only feeling you have is to give this joy, this peace, this happiness to as many other people as you can. Your kindness still remains, but your wanting vanishes. And there can be no ill will anymore. That is totally gone. It seems crazy that we can have uh, ill will, blaming, uh, punishment to people already hurting enough. We don't want to hurt them anymore. We don't want to hurt ourselves. We just have this wonderful sense of kindness and protection and giving and sharing and trying to take away any obstacles which other people have and what we have 
So we tend to be this beautiful person sitting under the Bodhi tree, just wanting to give and to share and have gratitude, even gratitude towards the, the tree under which you imagine you're sitting is protecting you. And because it protects you, you don't have to be concerned about weather or rain or anything. Everything is, this is good people, kind people are always protected, not just by uh, nature, by heavenly beings and all sorts of other beings come to look after you. And they simply do that because it's an act of kindness and inspiration. Uh, they get inspired by seeing someone who treads so softly in this world, they hardly leave a footprint. And you find that you are that person who's sitting quietly. And all you can feel is the, is the breeze on your body kind of caressing you. It's not cold, it's not hot, it's always refreshing. Your body is so free and empowered, it can change you know, the feeling of that wind and feel it's just refreshing, bracing, calming, never unpleasant at all. And you can smell in all the forests which I went through in Thailand in those years. There's always a beautiful smell. There's always some flower in bloom. And you would, even if you were smart enough, you could tell the time of the year by how the forest smelt. The different flowers bloom at different times of the year. And there's always something there. The forest which I went into was always fragrant. And you can smell that fragrance yourself in this moment. It's like you imagine you're an enlightened being in the forest and you have no burdens at all, nothing you have to achieve. Everything which had to be done has been done. You're at the finish line of the spiritual life. So you don't have to struggle and to push yourself. You're already there. So you totally let go. And because you let go, your mind can really relax. That's its gift. That's its present, is the present. And now you can just enjoy the peace, the safety, the freedom of being fully enlightened. You don't need anything. Because you don't need anything, you can't want anything. You're at peace and it's not boring. The energy, the piti sukha, which comes up when the mind is still and peaceful and silent. The energy is just so fantastic, so powerful. Just imagine what it must feel like to be fully enlightened. Nothing more to be done. And everything which you kind of are worried about will all be taken care of for you. Nothing to do, nothing to want, nothing to regret. At last, you are free. Just how peaceful and beautiful it is. And other people will see you. And that is your teaching to them. You don't even need to open your mouth to talk. Sometimes people see a quiet nun just sitting there peaceful and ease, and that is the teaching, not in words, but in behavior. You're showing them the gift of peace, the beauty of silence, the fragrance of a life well lived. And that's you who's giving that, whether you're uh, in robes or in lay clothes, this is your expression of the Dharma. Imagine what that must feel like. So here you are, with nothing to do in the whole world, and you're perfectly safe, secure, free. Nothing can hurt or harm you. Your body is not you. It will get old and fade away, but that's not you. So you're not worried about anything. People give you food and you can eat it. If you don't give you food, 
you just maybe get a bit tired, but that's fine. You're fully free, enlightened of concerns for the future or the past. And this means that there's nothing which you aspire towards anymore. All of those uh, wanting and changing and fixing up, just imagine that all vanished. There's nothing more to do. Because there's nothing more to do. You're at peace. And you let that moment stay there. You don't try and find something to do. You let the stillness stay with you. You've done everything. You've worked hard. Now this is the result. You never need to work again. The body always torturing you either big sickness or small sickness. But you transcended that body now. You're with your mind. And the mind is powerful. It's the forerunner of all things. When your mind is peaceful and still, of course, so is your body. You're sitting here, enjoying the absence of all wanting to change or control. And the restlessness, the stillness, just can't find a footing in you. You don't want anything, you don't need anything. And because the wanting and restlessness vanish, so does the tiredness. We're not spending any energy on this. The energy which we have remains as it is. We're at peace. The tiredness just cannot find a footing either. It is here. Not thinking of what you're supposed to be doing. You're already doing what needs to be done. It's already been done. So you can relax and rest. Not knowing that you have to do the job later. There's no more jobs to be done. You're free at ease. Other people may criticize you, but that's not the point. There's always sounds in this world. And some of the critics, they don't know what they're really saying. They're kind of testing you. And when you can smile, instead of frowning, then you're free. No words can ever harm you or hurt you again. Your own kindness and peace and stillness, that is what you hear. And it's like the whole world stops. You're just here. Why? Because there's nothing. You're free. Nothing needed to be attained anymore. All striving and struggling are gone. You really are free. You just imagine this. You're a newly enlightened being. What does it feel like? You start to enjoy what is called the taste of enlightenment. I must feel. It's pretty cool. Please excuse me. I can't speak anymore. Just get into it. See what happens.
So it's time to gently come out from the meditation. Notice how you feel. How peaceful it was. And in your own time, so open your eyes. Thank you for participating. See you later.